the amazing Eratosthenes. Let's take a fun trip back to ancient Egypt and find out why this guy was so amazing. Eratosthenes was a Greek scientist working in ancient Egypt for the Pharaoh. He is most famous for his amazingly accurate estimate of the size of the earth in a brilliant experiment that he conducted at the dawn of recorded history in 240 BC. In this video, we'll take a hands-on approach and see how he accomplished this seemingly impossible task. To begin, let's warp back to 2560 BC, when the ancient Egyptians built the Great Pyramid of Giza. Even that far back, the Egyptians were able to align the largest pyramid ever built to better than one-tenth degree accuracy to true north. The ancient Egyptian builders and surveyors were no slouches in producing amazingly accurate measurements using the crudest of tools made of wood, string, stone, clay, and other available materials. In 332 BC, Alexander the Great conquered Egypt and installed his own dynasty of pharaohs, the so-called Ptolemies. Around 240 BC, Eratosthenes lived and produced his famous estimate of the Earth's size, the earliest known based on scientific methods. If you notice in that picture of a Ptolemy pharaoh, there are pyramids in the background. On the table is a globe indicating that the Greek and Egyptian scientists already realized the Earth was a sphere. In 1492, Christopher Columbus stumbled into the New World, using an estimate of the size of the Earth far smaller than Eratosthenes. In the 1732 years between Eratosthenes and Columbus, no one had actually sailed around the Earth, so the size estimate was subject to a great range of values and methodologies. Around 245 BC, Pharaoh Ptolemy III hired Eratosthenes as tutor for his kids and as a librarian at the Great Library of Alexandria. Egypt is a hot, dry desert country pretty much, and the Egyptians were vitally dependent upon the Nile River for fresh water, irrigation, fishing, and transportation. Most of the people lived in a fertile strip along the Nile and in the fan-shaped Nile Delta. Once a year, the Nile would flood, carrying silt from the south, which would fertilize the farmlands. The Egyptians always lived in a precarious balance with the Nile, at least until the Aswan High Dam built in 1970. Sometimes the floods would not come, causing drought and starvation in Egypt as the crops failed. Sometimes heavy floods would overwhelm the banks, washing out roads, villages, farmlands, and livestock. The farmers needed to know the cycles of the Nile and the seasons, when to plant and harvest, when to expect floods, and when the seasons would change. Predicting these events accurately was vital for the farmers, but also important for the pharaoh to support taxation, land management, and religious ceremonies. This gave rise to Egyptian surveyors, builders, recorders, and bureaucracy. When the Nile flooded, it often washed away land markers, and the surveyors had to reestablish these markers to avoid fights between landowners. Predicting seasons was vital to agriculture, and the Egyptians knew the seasons were linked to the periodic motion of the sun and stars. The ancient Egyptians recorded data on the sun and stars and used this to predict Nile floods and weather cycles. Their motion was so important that it got incorporated into the religion. The sun would be born in the east, right across the sky, and die in the west each day. Stars were known to rotate around a north star, and finding local true north was easy in a mostly cloudless sky. Even children in ancient Egypt were aware of the cycles of the sun and could play games by tracking the shadow of an obelisk with rocks during the day and throughout the year. By plotting the tracks of these rocks, they could come up with the motion of the sun during the shortest and longest day of the year. High noon occurred when the shadow was the shortest and the length of the noon shadow varied through the year between limits which marked the summer and winter peaks. As chief librarian, Eratosthenes would have had access to the historical archives of Egypt from ancient times. Legend has it that he noticed one report from the residents of Aswan, which stated that there was a deep well there with an interesting history. Every year on June 21st at high noon exactly, the overhead sun shines directly down the well, casting no shadow. At no other time of the year did this happen. This report caught his immediate interest. He was already convinced the earth was a sphere, so this event in Aswan meant that at high noon, he could draw a straight line between the sun, the well, and the center of the earth itself. He checked the sun records for Alexandria, 
a town 524 miles north of Aswan. They reported the stone columns there cast a noticeable shadow on June 21st. He started thinking about why this might be. Notice on this model there are three pairs of obelisks, one on a flat white plane, a slightly curved blue surface, and a more curved red surface. Notice that the shadows on the flat surface stay equal during the sun's motion, but when the sun is directly overhead, the curved surfaces show one with no shadow, while the other casts a shadow. Also, the greater the curvature, the greater the shadow length. So, in Eratosthenes' mind, the Aswan and Alexandria shadow situation was telling him something about the curvature of the Earth itself. This was a key clue for Eratosthenes, and he started drawing models of the sun, the well, and the Earth to see what's up with that. He put together the following model, which is key to understanding his famous experiment. The model makes four key assumptions. First, the sun's rays at Aswan and Alexandria are parallel. The Earth is a sphere. Alexandria was directly north of Aswan, that is, local noon occurs at the same time. Lastly, line segment AC transverses the two parallel rays. Let's look at these assumptions. Why did Eratosthenes assume sunlight struck the Earth as parallel rays? Well, from vertical columns it was easy to observe how shadows move during the day, showing the sun's rays were parallel as they struck the Earth. From Euclid, he knew that if the sun and Earth were very distant, the incoming rays would be so close to exactly parallel, he could ignore any small errors, simplifying the problem. Why did Eratosthenes assume Earth was a round ball, a sphere? When he closely watched ships departing the lighthouse at Alexandria, they would sink below the horizon until only the top of the sails were visible. If he then climbed the lighthouse over 400 feet high, he could again see the ship. This was certainly more consistent with a round earth than a flat earth. The next evidence came from watching the stars from the observatory at the library. He was famous for mapping over 700 stars, and by plotting the motion of the stars, he could easily trace them wheeling around a central point. At night, it was easy to find the directions of true north by finding the one star which appeared stationary through the night, Thuban in those days. To Eratosthenes, this circular motion clearly rotated around an axis running through the top of the earth or true north. Either the earth was a ball which rotated every 24 hours, or the earth was fixed, and the heavenly shell rotated every 24 hours. Which do you think he thought it was? Lastly, the sun and moon were spheres. Some planets appeared as tiny balls, and lunar eclipses showed the Earth's shadow across the moon as spherical. Why did Eratosthenes assume Alexandria was north of Aswan and that local noon would occur at the same time in both locations? Many possibilities, a most likely explanation. Local north was easy to establish by the sun shadow method. When an obelisk shadow reached a minimum during the day, it was local noon and the shadow aligned with true north. Sighting the north star at night gave the same local true north direction. This also set the other local cardinal points east, south, west, and bearings in between. The local surveyors would have identified and mapped stationary reference points, such as prominent land features, obelisks, wells, etc. The local data would be used to build larger section maps until the whole of Egypt was mapped. Also, good maps were critical to the pharaoh. They fostered better land and sea navigation, fewer wrecks, lost caravans, etc. They settled land disputes after Nile floods, maintaining roads and trade routes, taxation and land concessions, and military uses. There's the famous lost army of a Persian king. 50,000 warriors were lost in a legendary sandstorm in 525 BC. So the pharaoh had powerful reasons to invest in good surveyors, maps, and scientific experts to support key government functions. Also, Egyptians believed the sun rode across the sky from east to west each day. Eratosthenes would have made the connection to the midday sun event moving across Egypt from east to west during the day, and to the same 24-hour rotation of the stars at night. At any instant, towns along a north-south line, Meridian, would experience local high noon when the sun's shadow on an obelisk was the shortest. Why did Eratosthenes assume that line segment AC crossed or transversed the two parallel lines formed by the sun's rays? Living just before Eratosthenes was Euclid, 
another Greek famous as the father of geometry. Euclid's elements of geometry had shown that lines cutting across parallel lines, transversals, have special properties. The best way to see it is to take it step by step. He showed that if the yellow lines are parallel, then the red transversal would cut across both yellow lines at the same angle. On the figure, angles S show this property. These angles are called corresponding angles, and Euclid showed they are always equal if the yellow lines are parallel. That is intuitive looking at the figure, but Euclid proved it. The next property was when two lines crossed, they produced equal angles across the vertex. These are called opposite angles, and Euclid proved they are equal. Lastly, since all three angles S are equal, the bottom angle S equals the middle angle S. These are called alternate interior angles, and Euclid proved they were equal for any line transversing parallel lines. So, using basic geometry, Eratosthenes drew his simplified Aswan Alexandria model as shown. Angle S was the shadow cast by the obelisk in Alexandria. But more important, angle S was also the interior angle from the center of the earth to both cities. This was his great insight. If he could somehow measure the angle of the shadow at Alexandria on June 21st at high noon, he knew that at Aswan there was no shadow there at that moment. It greatly simplified things. The other thing he noticed, remember the earlier picture that showed the greater the curvature, the longer the shadow? Somehow the angle S was saying something about the curvature of the whole earth. Then he realized that if you know the distance over the earth between Aswan and Alexandria, now known to be 524 miles, you could use a pizza slice approach to overlay slices until the entire earth was covered. However many slices of equal size it would take to fill the pizza would allow multiples of the distance between the two cities to be added until the whole earth was spanned. This simplified model would potentially allow Eratosthenes to measure the entire earth. He only had to know the distance between two cities and the angle of the shadow at noon on June 21st in Alexandria. Not bad for 240 BC. We're almost there. But how did Eratosthenes in 240 BC measure the angle of the shadow in Alexandria? Firstly, he would have probably used a tall vertical structure, the bigger the better, because it would have cast a longer shadow. History says he used a gnomon, but nobody knows for sure if he constructed a measurement device or used an existing sundial. He may have designed and built an instrument to measure the angle as precisely as materials and craftsmanship allowed in 240 BC. He knew from Euclid it was easy to bisect any angle using nothing more than a straight edge, string, and a marker. The red circle is drawn centered at the vertex, and green circles are drawn centered where the red circles intersect the lines. Radii R are drawn from the centers of the green circles to where they intersect. Finally, the line connecting the center of the red circle and the intersection forms two identical triangles back to back. Since corresponding angles of these triangles are equal, they split the angle A into two equal subangles. Eratosthenes could have used this simple method to keep bisecting angles to smaller and smaller fractions of a full circle producing one half, one quarter, one eighth, one sixteenth, as far as materials and eyesight allowed. He could have produced a shadow scale similar to this to measure the shadow angle or some variant of it. The details of the equipment Eratosthenes used are lost to history, but just for fun let's do our own experiment using a tall pointy obelisk casting shadows onto circles on the ground marked in degrees. Eratosthenes did not have the degree system for angle. He would have used Egyptian units, but just for fun let's do the experiment using modern degrees and miles. So, here we are outside the Great Library of Alexandria on June 21st in the year 240 BC. We are waiting for the sun to come up, so here we go. Let's get into a basket and fly above the obelisk so we can look straight down. Here comes the sun. Noon, then sundown. Did you catch that? Well, Eratosthenes did not have instant replay, but fortunately we do. In this experiment, he would have captured the moment when the shadow was shortest, marking local high noon. So let's back it up and have another look. And there's noon. As you can see, the actual angle is a little more than 7 degrees. I read that as 7.2 degrees. Eratosthenes reported his results in terms of fractions of a full circle, reporting that the shadow angle was 1 50th of a full circle. A full circle being 360 degrees divided by 50 equals 7.2 degrees. Eratosthenes now knew that the angle S in our previous drawing was 1 50th of a full circle. 
As a side note, here is what he would have seen if he had used his simple angle scale, showing the shadow cast as approximately one fiftieth of a full circle. Now let's see what he did with this information. Using Euclid's proof that alternate interior angles of a transversal across parallel lines are equal, he then knew that the central angle between S1 and Alexandria was 1 50th of a full circle, and the distance along the Earth was 524 miles. Eratosthenes would have reasoned that if one pizza slice of angle 1 50th was 524 miles along the outer edge, then two pizza slices fitted together would have a total central angle of 2 50ths of a full circle, and the distance would be doubled to 1048 miles. So, using this method, he would have multiplied the 524 miles by 50 to estimate the distance around the entire Earth. That equals 26,200 miles around the Earth. The current value is 24,860 miles. Eratosthenes did this estimate in 240 BC, more than 22 centuries ago, with little more than string, obelisks, wood, stone, and a few camels. He also had the great records, tools, and tradecraft of the Egyptian surveyors and pyramid builders that came before. An amazing accomplishment by any standard. Eratosthenes did not have modern units of distance. The Egyptian unit was the stadia, and it is not known which value for the stadia he used. Some references say the stadia he used was 500 feet, others 600 feet, etc. Eratosthenes reported the distance between Aswan and Alexandria was 5,000 stadia. Some legends say he used the time it took a camel to walk between the two cities to estimate the distance, but nobody knows for sure. It is likely the Egyptian surveyors mapped the country more accurately over the centuries. It's also possible that as chief librarian, he may have commissioned a special survey to confirm the maps. But in any case, this table compares some common values to bound how close he came in 240 BC. No matter how you slice it, we're talking 240 BC using the crudest of tools. Eratosthenes went on to establish a grid system to chart the known world. Ironically, over 1700 years later, Columbus's map of the known world was not substantially better than the maps inspired by Eratosthenes centuries earlier. More details had been filled in by that time, but Columbus chose a low ball size estimate compared to the famous estimate by Eratosthenes. Eratosthenes is sometimes called the father of geography, just as Euclid is coined the father of geometry. It's easy to view the astounding accomplishments of ancient scientists like Eratosthenes as produced by intellectual giants, but Eratosthenes would have been the first to credit the genius of the Egyptian surveyors, pyramid builders, and the ancient Egyptian civilization, which provided a hands-on laboratory for the application of scientific and natural theories developed by the Greek and other philosophers of the ancient world. It was the perfect marriage of the Greek philosophical tradition to the hands-on engineering expertise of the ancient Egyptians that enabled such amazing accomplishments as Eratosthenes estimating the size of the earth without even leaving Egypt. We hope you enjoyed this video as much as we enjoyed making it. If so, please feel free to share with your friends and teachers. We would love to hear your feedback, so either click on one of the like-dislike icons, or better yet, leave a comment on YouTube. It has been gratifying to see folks in so many countries view this video. As they say in Japan, Arigato gozaimashita. Thanks. If you enjoyed this mixture of science and ancient history, you might also enjoy our new ebook. Christopher Columbus and the Land Bridge. This is colorful history and science for young minds. It weaves together epic tales, high adventures, and discoveries which set off world-shaking events. It is simple enough to engage inquisitive kindergartners, yet is meaty and salty enough to hold the interest of even jaded high schoolers. It bridges across centuries to illuminate why the world shook in ways that no one could have foreseen, not just what happened. This is a good book to give to a young relative and a perfect book for reading to inquisitive kids.